And what's happened is the Hollywood, um, the arms of the Hollywood studios that do independent films, Sony Picture Classics, uh, uh, you know, companies like that uh, come, Focus Features, and then the true independents, you know, the Lionsgates, that I guess Lionsgate Summits, the um, you know companies like that come, and so they have representatives here, and the agencies that represent talent are here. And so you always have now at TIFF the buying and selling of films. So it's become uh, like Cannes, like other, you know, like the American film market, a place where the films are, are bought and sold. And so and every year at TIFF we see that and deals are done and films are signed and all of that. So it's really evolved. Are you seeing an increase, for instance, in your own activity on a year to year basis uh, in terms of how many distribution deals you're doing or sales agency deals you're doing for clients that have films in the festival? Yeah, I would say for us it's really more, uh, it tends to be more co-productions. Mm -hmm. In other words, the co-productions you know, the co -productions tend to be sometimes a little bit of a bigger budget. You've got a partner in another jurisdiction. And so we've been involved in structuring some of those. And then when they come to TIFF, uh, there are the types of films that often can attract buyers. You know, uh, when it comes to the smaller films, it's very ad hoc. You just don't know what is going to work and what is going to be spurned by the market. So again, you know, as a lawyer, I'm on that kind of horrible mercenary side of the business. You know, we use that part of the brain that isn't creative, uh, like all of you good people. And it's just that mercenary part, which is, you know, film could be money. How much can we make? We give you minimum guarantee or advance because we want to make more than that. Or otherwise, it was a stupid business deal. So we deal with those people, and those people view films as commodities. They, you, know, you may be very talented, you may be a talented writer or director, you may have a vision, an artistic vision that you want to uh, uh, exhibit, which is fantastic, but the business side is very mercenary, and they just look at a film as, you know, what's the market potential, who's in it, how can I sell this thing around the world? Will I make money or not? And if not, then I'm generally not interested. So that's the part of the business that we uh, will deal with. Let me ask you something else. Um, producers that are about to um, have a film shown at the festival um, who maybe have had some money problems, some budget problems, and have not necessarily cleared all the rights that they need. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Eno in a sec. But festival licenses. Let's say somebody says, um, "Listen, we got it. We got into TIFF. We want to show it. Do you have all your music licenses cleared?" Well, no. But they're willing to give us a festival license. Good idea. Bad idea. Well, I mean, it's a bad idea in the sense that obviously. If you can, it's always optimal to fully clear a production, not just for some kind of temporary purpose. So like in other words, in a perfect world, it would be better if you could get complete clearance, you know. So, uh, you know, I noticed there were quite a few documentary makers here. Uh, I'm sure the documentary makers will know in particular that, you know, when you make a film, it's very important to identify everything that's copyrightable from someone else that you put in there, you know, whether it's clips, whether it's music, whatever, and then decide whether or not you need to clear it. And that, and, and of course, if you're substantially copying copyrighted work, you need to get permission or it's copyright infringement unless it's fair dealing. And fair dealing is a defense particularly of interest to documentary makers and the Supreme Court of Canada has, uh, you know, won't get into it, but Supreme Court of Canada has kind of identified the criteria for fair dealing. It ha it's a two-part test that has to be for certain purposes. Uh, the purposes are criticism, review, research, private study, which is usually irrelevant, news reporting, and more recently, the amendment of the Copyright Act for parody, satire, and education. So it has to be for one of those purposes, and it has to be fair. That's the big part of the test, what is fair. So you have to be doing that analysis generally, generally. Secondly, if you've got images of, of people in the film, you have to, like on the poster, mm -hmm. reproduced, you have to think about other claims, like for example, personality rights, publicity rights, are you, do you have a celebrity on the poster without permission? 
uh, you know, are you going to get in trouble for that? You obviously have to worry about defamation if you're saying negative things about people. You can imagine a documentary would often have very negative things to say about somebody. Uh, and there's no problem being negative as long as you can support the assertions that you're making. And if not, you know, you may be slapped with a, with a lawsuit. So there's this general issue of kind of, you're, you're putting a film in, you know, you, you're evaluating what's there, and then going to David's book. So first, you have to decide, am I going to rely on fair dealing, or do I feel I need to get permission, as an example? And then once you've decided I'm not relying on fair dealing, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I believe I should either because uh, I think that I need permission, because otherwise I could get sued, or I'm not sure, but I don't want to take a chance, and I'm risk averse, you know, then you need to clear. And at that point, you get to David's question, which is, OK, well, what does it mean to clear? Well, the copyright owners, whether it's music, whether it's artwork, whether it's whatever it is, only they can authorize your use of these copyrighted material. So they can authorize it just for a festival. They can authorize it for three festivals. They can authorize it for Canada only. They can authorize it for 10 years, but not more than 10 years. So copyright owners can license in any way they want. And so it is possible to go to people who own copyrights and say, you know what, I don't have money. I just need your permission to show this in a festival in the Toronto Film Festival and nothing else. I can't, if, if a buyer comes, you know, if Focus Features sees what a fantastic film and they want to license it, I'm going to have to go back to you now because now if they're going to try to put this in movie theaters and distribute it, I don't have permission now for all this copyrighted material. So that's the evaluation that you're, that you're making. There was a wonderful um, music documentary that premiered at TIFF um, several years ago, uh, not that long ago, maybe three or something three or four years ago, where they had a festival license to use the music in the film. And when they went back to get the rights for the music for commercial exploitation, for broadcast, etc., they were refused. And why were they refused? Because the band that was featured in this documentary had decided that they were now going to make their own documentary. So they caused the <laughs> publisher to reject. And these people had made this film and had invested all this money. What kind of provisions, Hillary, can a producer have in an agreement to prevent that kind of thing from happening? Well, I think it's having you know a pre-negotiated schedule, right? Like if you if you're going to license that music, and most common it happens with you know recognizable music where it's going to be expensive, and you have a limited budget, and you don't sort of have, you know, it, there's no point at that moment to be paying to license it worldwide if you don't even know what your deals are. So if you can negotiate some kind of step deal at that point, it sort of ties up and, and locks you know. What do you mean by step deal? Like for the festival you know, rights, it's X dollars. For Canada rights, it's this. For North America, it would be this. And also, potentially, what kind of exploitation you're doing, if it's theatrical only, if it's going to be theatrical and television. Now, there are a lot of different ways in which you can carve up the license to make sure that you can access those rights when the time comes, but you know, you're know you not paying for it all up front. The other thing is, you may be on a limited budget. It might be the place where you're willing to just get your um, festival license, but you know, it's likely that you may want to negotiate something like that with your distributor. And if you have your pre-negotiated step deal, it just becomes part of the analysis of making your business deal with the distributor. They may assume the obligations because then they know that they can have that cleared for whatever sales they make. It's not a payment you made up front, so you haven't sort of incurred those costs, and it becomes part of the negotiation. I mean, I've seen that on films that have been really made for festival release, and then they just didn't have the money to do it, and they use you know, recognizable music in it. They wanted to license it because it was really meaningful to how they wanted to show the film. So. There are sort of options, but it becomes part of your business assessment, right? Mm -hmm. And and you just sort of to, to carry on David's point about how important it is to get your clearances. You know, at the end of the day, you get your insurance so that you know uh, so that you protect yourself in the event of a, that a claim comes. But your insurer is expecting that the claim isn't even going to come. Like they want the level of um, clearance to be such that a claim couldn't arise. Not how defensible the claim is necessarily. So if you've, you know, if you've taken uh, the position that you know, 
this is fair use, or if you've obtained certain kinds of uh, release from somebody um, that you're using in your film, but you know, you know that there are, has been problems, you know, that person is going to wait till the day it's about to be released at the festival before they, you know, put in their notice that they're going to bring a claim, they call the festival. You know, those things can put a real um, hamper in your plans to release it at the festival. So it's important to plan and, and sort of see how those things can arise when you go to exploit it. Eric? I think, yeah, something that bears saying, uh, uh, two things. Number one is, um, for a festival, I think some people are under the impression that you don't need to have E&O insurance in place when you're at a film festival. Mm -hmm. It's somehow private screening, or it's, it's, it, it's, it's, doesn't, it's not elevated to the status of a all, you know, full-blown uh, release of a film. I would totally disagree. Yeah. Um, when that film is first put out into the public, published uh, would be the word, um, you are at the highest level of risk of a lawsuit coming in. And remember, <laughs> this is the second point, all the discussions about clearances and knowing who the copyright owner is, and you did clear these rights, but you didn't clear those rights, those are things that are probably not covered by your E&O policy. It's nothing to do with E&O. When you're dealing on a contractual basis with someone, or you should be dealing with someone on a contractual basis, that's not an error or, a, or omission on your part by not getting those rights. The errors and omissions really cover those things that come out of left field. The, the copyright, you didn't realize that the poster in the background actually wasn't artwork done by your art department. It was actually a poster someone pulled off a wall and put in the back of your film. Right. So you didn't have the opportunity to think through this one and make that clearance. That's an error. Um, and that would be covered. But my point is, that even when you're showing that film at a festival, if that artwork is on the wall, and I've seen some beautiful nuisance lawsuits. I saw a, literally a, this is on an HBO movie, a piece of uh, art on the wall, passing by in a scene, but distinct enough you could see it. $40,000 lawsuit successful. Um, they claim more, but the insurance company said to us, Alliance, Listen, you guys are in it for the first 10,000 deductible. We'll kick in another 30. If you say no, you're on your own. You can fight this thing, but that's the best we're going to do for you. I've often said that uh, you can make a great career out of making E and O claims because uh, people do fold. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, they get worried about the potential maximum exposure. It's it can be pretty uh, nasty and bizarre.